Prajwa was born and grew up in Gantok in the Sikkim region of northeast India. His father was an Indian Nepali and his mother Nepalese. He was educated at the Truman State University in Missouri, a long way from home, um, and at Oxford, where he was a writer in residence at the Oxford Hindu Center until just recently. Um, before committing to a writing career, Prajwa actually worked as an advertising executive for the Village Voice in New York City, which just goes back in time to the rock music center of the world, doesn't it? Village Voice? Uh, after I started working at the Village Voice, it sort of ceased to be as cool as it was in uh, the 90s. That so. wasn't because of you. It may have been because of me, I don't know. Yeah. Um, in 2011, Prajwal, at the age of 26, was the first, or rather the youngest Indian author to be offered a two-book, multi-country deal, leading him to be labeled the next big thing in Asian fiction. His first book, The Gurkha's Daughter, was a collection of short stories describing the experience of the Nepalese people and the Nepalese di diaspora. The Gurkha's Daughter was shortlisted for the 2013 Dylan Thomas Prize, which is one of the leading prizes in the literary world, so it was quite an honor. His novel, Land Where I Flee, was just recently published here in the UK. He's been listed as one of Blackwell's rising stars, and he's one of Time Out's five Asian authors to watch. How is this, um, should we call it a meteoric rise to stardom? Uh, how's that affected you in your writing? Well, you, you feign embarrassment of it in public and feel extremely smug about it in private. Uh, has that affected my writing? No, no, not really. You, you've got to learn not to take these labels too seriously. I, I think uh, the South Asian media can get extremely generous <laughs> at times. And, you know, there's the ripple effect at play. Uh, the South Asian media goes, he's the next big thing in South Asian fiction. When these papers that were calling me that hadn't even read a word of what I'd written. <laughs> no, it, was, it was really bizarre. I mean, they were calling me these great names, and I wasn't about to distance myself from them, but they hadn't read a single story I'd written. I hadn't published a single story until uh, uh, after I got the book deal. So you, you just laugh them off. Yeah, but enjoy it while you can. Oh yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, you started with a short story, a book of short stories, and then you moved on to a novel. Um, was that a big, a big change? Was it hard to move from the short story genre to the novel? See, uh, Adrian, I, I wrote a collection of short stories because I thought it would be easier than attempting to write a novel. I was wrong, of course I was. Um, um, writing the novel was a lot easier than writing the collection of short stories for a few reasons. I wrote the novel after I wrote the collection of short stories. Could it have been that I'd evolved somewhat as a writer between the two books? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, was also, I also wrote the novel at a gorgeous time in my life. It was this, this, this wonderful time. i just got in this two book deal. There were, there were newspapers endowing on me one beautiful sobriquet after another. So everything that could go right was going right. Nothing that could go wrong was going wrong. But you didn't feel pressured because of all of that? A little bit, mm. a little bit. There were times I was, I was lying awake at night wondering, if, wondering what would happen if, if I didn't live up to you know, all these great things. That, That's pressure. That is pressure. There were times, but uh, I realized quickly on that I could either be pressured and take all these things seriously or just dismiss them, no, just okay. laugh them off. Yeah. Um, Land Where I Flee centers on four grown-up children traveling from their homes in the U.S. and the U.K. to Gantok to celebrate their grandmother's special 84th birthday. Um, each of them is a disappointment in their own way, in, in their grandmother's eyes. Uh, can you tell us a bit about each one of them and, and, sure. and how, why the grandmother doesn't approve of some of the, their lives? 
Yeah, absolutely. So there are these four orphan siblings that a grandmother has looked after, and they've all moved on abroad. There is the eldest, Bhagwati. I mean, this is a Brahmin family that they come from, an extremely conservative, self-righteous Brahmin family uh, that needs to be kicked where it hurts them the most, uh, sort of like my Brahmin family. And uh, so uh, there's Bhagwati, the oldest, who has eloped with someone of uh, not just the lower caste, but the lowest of the low castes, and uh, a so-called untouchable. The grandmother hasn't been able to forgive her, despite 18 years having lapsed between the elopement and now. And Bhagwati is going to see her grandmother for the first time since the elopement. That's the eldest. Then there is, there is Manasa, who is the uh, second sibling. I've, I've noticed with a lot of South Asian families, if an older sibling has done something wrong, the pressure to do right, do everything by the book, falls on a younger sibling. Not just Asian families. Oh, everywhere? I think so. Okay, all right, okay, <laughs> sure. Um, so Mansa gets married to this, this man who is from one of the oldest families of Nepal. He, he, he's he's, a, he's a, you know, an upper echelon Brahmin and uh, went to Cambridge. She went to Oxford. But a marriage isn't exactly working, and the grandmother hates that. Then there is, there is the older brother called Agastya, who is a closeted homosexual living in New York in a relationship with a nurse. He's a doctor in a relationship with a nurse, and his family has absolutely no clue that he is leading this clandestine existence. And then there is a fourth character called, uh, you know, the, the, the youngest sibling called Rutwa, who is a writer. He has often been remarked in many reviews as Prajwal Parajuli gone bad. <laughs> he's, he's, he's supposed to be my alter ego, and maybe he is, but I mean, you'll have to be the judge of that when you read the book. Um, so yes, these are four siblings who all convene in their hometown of Gangtok, Sikkim, to celebrate their grandmother's landmark 84th birthday, and secrets threaten to get unraveled. Past follies get revisited. A lot of angst is brought into the picture. So, so I mean, it makes for a juicy family saga. And, and entertaining, too, because it's, it's, not, it's serious, but it's not totally serious. They're entertaining. Sure, sure. Yeah. Can you read something for us? Uh, sure. Um, I'll uh, read a... Uh, I've, I've spoken to you about Bhagwati, who is the eldest of the siblings. She lives in Boulder, Colorado, has just been fired from her job as a dishwasher. I mean, I mean, this is a book full of stereotypes, you know, a South Asian refugee living in America working as a dishwasher, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, she, she returns home to find her husband, Ram, the untouchable, about, the untouchable about whom I spoke earlier, uh, rehearsing for something. Okay, and uh, this puts her in a reflective mood. In apartment 213, sprawled on the flowery bed sheet that covered the carpet, was a headphone decked Ram repeating, thank you for calling Dominoes, how may I help you, over and over again. When he noticed Bhagwati, he removed his headphones and smiled. Got the Domino's job, he said in halting English, and then, moving to the comfort of Nepali, added, I'm practicing how to answer the phone. That's nice, Bhagwati faked enthusiasm. At least one of us will be working. You're back early, Ram said. Did you take a half day? No, I quit. Bhagwati lied. Ram was quiet. It was getting too much. The man had begun touching me. What will you do when you get back from India? Look for a new job, something that requires more qualification than the kind of jobs illegals do. A hotel, Ramas, front desk. Reservations, perhaps. No standing up required. 
When do you start? This afternoon, Ram said. Thank you for calling Domino's. How may I help you? That's fine. Now change the do to da. It's not Domino's, but Domino's. Da, 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 Ram repeated. I'll stop now. Will you join me to pray before I head to Domino's? <laughs> How ironic it was that her husband, an untouchable, the lowest of the low cost, an upsetting byproduct of the heinous system that her ancestors helped create and propagate, should be so full of piety. He knew the shlokas, memorized elliptical Sanskrit mantras, read the Gita and understood what festival was celebrated for what reason. He was combative when she, a Brahmin, dismissed Hinduism's many superstitions, made her analyze and reanalyze these beliefs, and furnished her with the scientific reasoning behind them, which she begrudgingly acknowledged. And yet, he could never become a priest. He would never be allowed near the temple of most Hindus. He was a casualty of Hinduism who had chosen not to be a victim. An untouchable who had no shame about his low cost as much as he did of robbing his Brahmin wife of hers on account of a marriage to him. A bigger Hindu, a better Hindu than she or anyone she knew. Ram Bahadur Damai, her husband, whose kind the Christian missionaries had been targeting for centuries and whose family had stood firm in their devotion to Hinduism, naming their child after a Hindu god. Ram Bahadur Damai, of the Taylor caste, the father of a half caste children, who would thankfully not be taunted in this country for carrying in their bloodline accusations of incest and consanguinity. Ram Bahadur Damai, responsible for the biggest blemish anyone had brought on a family, for belonging to a family of tailors, of alterers and cutters, for altering family dynamics in a way that could never be unaltered, for ripping grandmother from granddaughter in a way they could never be rehemmed. Ram Bahadur Damai, who gave it two sons in whose DNA were Damai blood and Brahmin blood, one infiltrating another, poisoning another, the two sons her grandmother would never touch, whose presence would desecrate her ancestral house. Ram Bahadur Damai, the untouchable kicked out of Bhutan, was a better human being than any of her family members would ever be. Thank you.